Hi, this is Tony Northrup for Train Signal, and in this really quick video lesson, I'm going to cover telecommunications for the SSCP certification exam. I only have six slides here, and this is the first one, so you're already through one sixth of it. Up first, let's talk about the old traditional phone circuit. It's still really pervasive in homes and small businesses, though I personally don't have a traditional phone circuit. I just use my cell phone now. Traditional phone circuits have good quality. They're reliable. You pretty much pick it up and you have a dial tone every single time. And they're pervasive throughout the world. You can get basically a direct connection from your handset to anybody else's handset. And, you know, it's basically a physical pair of copper wires running across the world. A lot of people have one or two phone lines in their house and it doesn't cost too much. But if you're at an organization with a thousand employees, you wouldn't order that same type of phone line because it's just rather costly to scale. We'll talk about PBXs in the next slide. Also, traditional phones are pretty feature poor. Pretty much the feature they offer is you pick it up and you have a dial tone and you can dial some numbers and you can get through to wherever you're going. That's about the extent of it. If you're on the phone and somebody calls you, it's probably going to be a busy signal. Sometimes the telephone company will offer you voicemail services or call forwarding or a few other features, but uh, it's not very flexible. You really just have these like consumer set of features. Uh, traditional phone circuits do have a whole handful of security risks. Uh, denial of service is fairly easy. If somebody wants to prevent anybody from talking on the phone, you can just keep calling them over and over again. It's called war dialing. And then their phone will ring and they'll pick it up and it will just be a computer and they'll hang it up, but then their phone will ring again. Basically, it's easy to block somebody from using their phone. Um, there's also this technique called freaking and freaking with a PH can basically allow you to hijack other people's lines. And, you know, back in the days of 2600 Hertz, people freaked quite a bit and abused a lot of phone lines and got a lot of free phone calls and went to jail sometimes. Freaking still happens. Telephone companies have gotten much more sophisticated with their equipment. You can't just broadcast a sound <laughs> at the right frequency and start dialing anywhere in the world anymore. But there have been lots and lots of hacks that allow you to abuse what they call the PSTN, the Public Switch Telephone Network. Traditional phone circuits nowadays support caller ID, but that's easily hacked. You can put something in a web browser or a program on your cell phone and make your caller ID appear to be anything. So it, it's pretty easy to fake caller ID. You can't rely on that as an authentication mechanism. Um, and otherwise, they have absolutely no authentication or authorization or access control or encryption. You know, you can get a phone call from anybody. There's no security system that says, hey, is this guy allowed to call this guy? Uh, and when you actually pick up the phone and you talk to them, there's no way to know if it is who you think it is. I mean, you, I guess you can listen for the voice, but that's not especially reliable. And your phone isn't going to check their certificate or check their password or anything like that. There's no security. And if somebody else can plug their copper wires into your copper wires anywhere between your phone and the destination phone, they can just hear your conversation. That's it. They don't have to do any cracking or brute force attacking. They just have to get access to your physical wires, and then they have your whole conversation. So there's no security here. Uh, it can also be costly. You know, nowadays, most national calls are free for most telcos. Um, but if you call to another country, it can be outrageously expensive. There are also toll numbers that you can call that can charge quite a bit. Uh, this can become a problem because if somebody gets access to your phone and they just feel like messing up your world, <laughs> then they just call a bunch of 900 numbers. And next thing you know, you got hundreds of dollars in charges. So it'd be nice if you had a little more control, right? If you could allow some numbers but block other numbers, some sort of access control to your own system. That's where the PBX comes in, the private branch exchange. And this is what every medium-sized or larger organization uses. They have a box like shown in the picture there that takes in a circuit from the PSTN, from your telco provider. And this circuit is basically a bundled up bunch of lines. And it's smart about how it uses it. It can accept incoming calls and route it to one of a thousand different extensions without actually having a thousand pairs of copper wire phone lines going into it. It's a little more intelligent than that. The PBX can also provide really sophisticated features like voice routing. You know, somebody could call a main number and say, hey, Tony Northrop, please. And without bothering an operator, it can forward it. 
It also allows for sophisticated voicemail systems and call forwarding and conferencing. PBX systems have their own set of risks though. Uh, they still use the PSTN so you don't get encryption and anybody who can jump on the connection at your telephone network provider or at the other end of the call can hear your whole conversation. I'll say PBXs also don't get the attention that they deserve. A lot of IT guys are into networks or computers, but maybe they don't care about phone lines. Even to me, phone lines seem a little outdated nowadays, so they don't bother to learn it. So they get a PBX and they plug it in, but then they just leave everything in the default settings. This is unbelievably common and it has caused thousands and thousands of companies to get their PBXs hacked because you can connect to it and use the default password and then you're the administrator of the PBX, no matter who you are. And this can give you a lot of power. You might be able to listen to people's phone calls. You might be able to forward phone calls going to their sales team, to your own competing sales team. You can do some really scary stuff. You can also just use it to make outgoing phone calls so that they're paying for the phone calls instead of you. And of course, like any phone line, it's uh, susceptible to a denial of service attack. If somebody calls that number often enough, nobody else can get through. Now let's talk about voice over IP, commonly known as VoIP. VoIP, instead of using the public switch telephone network, the PSTN, it uses the good old internet. It takes all your voice communications and sticks them into IP packets and then sends them across the internet where there's a destination VoIP system that knows how to unwrap your voice from those packets and puts it into something that the person on the other end of the line can hear. When everything's working properly, VoIP systems work exactly like a regular telephone system. Sometimes they're even better because they can offer better audio quality and more sophisticated features, maybe even better reliability, but certainly better manageability. VoIP also has much lower costs than most PSTN systems because, well, when you make a phone call or you need to order a certain number of phone lines, you're kind of paying as you go. Each new phone line costs you a little bit more. Every phone call you make might cost you a few pennies. So the costs scale with your usage. VoIP works a little differently. You buy a VoIP phone, and if you're calling another VoIP customer on the internet, you just pay whatever you have to pay your ISP. And most ISPs don't charge based on usage. Still, it's kind of remarkable, but most ISPs will just give you all you can eat. You buy a circuit and you use all you want. Also, VoIP doesn't use very much bandwidth at all. It actually, if it's just voice, uses a really tiny, small connection and very little bandwidth. So you could cram 100 phone calls on a typical internet connection and still have some decent bandwidth available. VoIP has some cons still. Now, when VoIP was new, it's been around for a while now, but when it was first new, it was pretty terrible. <laughs> and I, I remember the company I was working for um, tried to use VoIP because, well, we were an ISP and we were hoping everybody was going to ditch their uh, telco and just buy more bandwidth from us so that they could use VoIP instead. So we really tried to get into VoIP and we started trying to, as they say, eat your own dog food. So we wanted to have a VoIP offering and we gave a bunch of employees VoIP phones, including myself, and it messed up my business life. It was so bad. I had to jump on conference calls with customers all the time and my voice would be all scratchy and words would just disappear and there'd be static and they'd be like, Tony, are you there? I can barely hear you. Uh, sometimes it would just freak out and make a bunch of noise on the line and they had to like kick me off the <laughs> conference call. So the early days of VoIP were terrible and it still kind of has a bad reputation for that. Uh, the reason being is jitter. With your regular telephone line with a pair of copper wires, you literally have a dedicated connection. And even though it, there might be a bit of delay, a bit of latency, as your call goes from your house in the US to the other side of the world in Australia, you know, it could be half a second of delay, a bit like those satellite conversations you can see on TV where you have to wait after you're done and the person doesn't talk back for a little bit. Well, with VoIP, it's not consistent. So there's that latency there, but it can be longer or shorter. And this isn't great for any sort of real-time communications because what happens is packet A will get there in half a second. Packet B won't get there until one and a half seconds. And then packet C might get there in another half a second. So packets are arriving out of order, which works just fine if it's a web page because your computer can reassemble them. 
but if it's a voice, <laughs> it's important that you hear each of the different vowels and consonants that I'm making in the right order. If they came through in the wrong order, it wouldn't make any sense at all. So jitter, which is uh, varying amounts of latency in a phone call, really destroys VoIP quality. And especially in the early days of VoIP, uh, the internet wasn't as reliable and consistent as it was now. Jitter is still a problem though, and the farther away your call has to travel across the internet, the more chance that some aspect of the internet is going to destroy your VoIP quality. So in my opinion at least, VoIP quality across the internet isn't as reliable as regular public switch telephone network calls. VoIP on an internet where you can control the LAN, way better, just because it's free for usage and it, you can have extremely high quality but VoIP on the internet can still be a little inconsistent. But with that said, hundreds of thousands, millions of people use VoIP calls all the time. Uh, you don't even have to pay for it. You can just go get a free Skype client or free Google Chat, lots of different instant messaging clients and make voice calls. Try it for yourself if you haven't. You'll find mixed results if you do it enough. It'll work great the first time and then terrible the next time and it'll be a little bit weird, but people have also become more accustomed to it. You know, back when VoIP was new, we actually had higher standards for phone calls because we were used to these PSTN calls and we expected everybody's voice to be crystal clear and there to be no latency. But as more and more people are making phone calls with VoIP and with mobile phones, we've all come to accept terrible phone quality somehow. So now we're used to static, we're used to having to yell on the phone, we're used to having to say, what, I couldn't hear you over the guy behind you honking his horn. Uh, so our standards have low lowered and VoIP becomes more and more reasonable. Uh, VoIP does have risks. First, it's more complex, so it has a greater attack surface. If you're accepting internet calls, then you're also vulnerable to internet attacks. Of course, anything that accepts an incoming connection is susceptible to a denial of service attack, so you're listening for incoming VoIP calls. Somebody can just send a whole bunch of fake calls to you and flood the system so that you can no longer receive calls. So the denial of service vulnerability that traditional circuits have VoIP has that too. VoIP clients also have to be smarter. They have to have software that can decode these packets, do lots of translation, and you know, provide features like voicemail and call forwarding. So the more complex the client is, the more vulnerable it is to attacks. The more code that is in the client, the better the chances that the software developer is going to introduce a bug or a vulnerability. Also, while the public switch telephone network has been around for a long time now. <laughs> VoIP has only been around for what 15, 20 years so it just hasn't withstood the test of time and sometimes we're still working bugs out though it's gotten more and more reliable in recent years and if you need to connect to another VoIP caller it's usually free because it's just crossing the internet and you know you don't have to pay something when you connect to a web server in Japan but if you have to connect to somebody with a traditional phone which most people are still using uh, it's going to cost you a little bit because they, there has to be some device that accepts your VoIP call and then transfers it over to the PSTN. So there'll be a fee for that. Now let's talk about wireless voice, which is what I use almost all the time personally. It has some big advantages. You can just take it with you anywhere. This is really a paradigm shift for me, and uh, I have a nine-year-old daughter who doesn't even understand the concept that a phone number used to identify not a person but a place. <laughs> like. When I was nine and I wanted to call my friend, I had to call my friend's house and then my call would get routed through their mom or dad. <laughs> and I would say, can I talk to Brian? <laughs> and they would say, all right, I'll get Brian on the phone. Because a phone number identified a house. And if you called a business, you didn't call a person at that business. You just called the business in general. Well, nowadays, phone numbers identify an individual more often than not. So if I were to call Brian, I would just dial Brian's phone number and I wouldn't have to talk to his mom. These wireless phones are also managed by your carrier, so they take care of the hardware, making sure that everything is compatible. They keep building new towers and trying to make sure that you have enough bandwidth. So that's all stuff you don't have to worry about. You don't have to run any cabling at all, in fact. You just buy a wireless phone and put it in your employee's hand, and they can talk anywhere, anywhere. And they have a whole bunch of features built into the phone. It's great. And you don't have to run any telephone cables. Wireless voice, of course, has plenty of problems as well. It's kind of ridiculously expensive compared to a traditional phone line and certainly a VoIP line. And the quality still varies. It's still pretty terrible. And when I'm driving away from my house, there's a dead zone of about two blocks. And if I'm talking on the phone when I go through it, my call just drops. And then there's this awkward moment where you hear the other person like, hello, Tony, are you there? Are you there? 
I'm going to have to hang up now. You don't seem to be there anymore. <laughs> so that's always weird. Of course, your wireless voice can call any sort of phone number so it can connect to the PSTN. Uh, because they're so mobile and you can just slip them in your pocket, you can also lose them or they can get stolen and they get stolen all the time. Some of that is being combated by uh, anti-theft technologies that are being built into the phones. Phones can't be so easily reused by a thief, which means they can't be easily stolen and they have GPS tracking in them so you can kind of find them over time. But the modern smartphone is actually extremely complex. This wasn't true of earlier mobile phones that basically just place phone calls exactly like an old school PSTN phone. Uh, nowadays they're smartphones and they have a thousand apps on them and this really complex operating system and constant network connectivity. That means they're vulnerable to attacks. You can get malware on it, you can get your phone hacked and cracked, and that's a big downside to it. Uh, they also have GPS systems in them that can reveal your location. And even if you turn off the GPS, if you're using the wireless network, well, wireless carriers can triangulate your position. They can see how far you are from three different towers and pretty much pinpoint exactly where you are. I personally, I'm thrilled with that. <laughs> I would love people to know exactly where I am at all times in case I'm in an accident or I have a heart attack or something, God forbid. But there are lots of people who don't want people to know where they are. Certainly a criminal element wouldn't want them to know where they are and law enforcement frequently will issue a warrant to the wireless carriers to figure out exactly where somebody's phone is by triangulation. So you should understand that that's a potential security vulnerability for you. Wireless voice tends to be pretty unreliable during emergencies. Anytime there's an attack or a disaster, everybody jumps on their cell phone to call somebody and that uses up all the circuits. Just like with plain old phones, caller ID is unreliable, it's easily spoofed, so don't use that as security. As I mentioned, the phones can be attacked just like any other smart device and the calls all have some kind of cost. Well, local calls of up to a certain number of minutes tend to be free, but international calls will have some cost. and. Uh, if you go over your number of minutes, you're going to end up paying something. So bills could really add up to you. And they could be abused by an angry employee who just decides to make a bunch of expensive calls and stick you with the bill. Last and definitely least is fax. Oh, I hate faxes. These have been popular since the 70s. And at the time, I'm sure it seemed like magic because you could take a piece of paper and teleport it anywhere in the world. <laughs> Uh, so as a result, it's widely accepted. Everybody all over the world has a fax machine plugged into an old copper pair and you can stick a piece of paper in and they'll get it. There's no risk of viruses really, though some fax machines can be hacked. They're usually such simple devices that they don't have a huge attack surface. There are several cons. Of course, you pay for the phone connection just like any other line. Uh, and they tend to be really slow. Like if you haven't faxed anything recently, it can take 20, 30 seconds to send a page to somebody, which in the modern era where you could just send an entire book in a split second across the internet, it seems painfully slow. The quality is also poor. It just comes out hard to read and all blocky and blurry. It's unbelievably bad. You also have to deal with busy signals because fax machines can typically only accept one call at a time. So if somebody's faxing something to it, nobody else can fax anything to it. Imagine if that were true of web servers. <laughs> if you went to a web server but sorry, somebody else is on CNN, maybe you could try back in a little bit and we'll give you the news then. Faxes are also susceptible to spam. People will just send junk mail to your fax machine. Oh, and a traditional fax machine requires paper. You get an incoming fax and it just prints it out for you. Now, lots of faxing happens on a more sophisticated level. Nowadays, I have a cloud service that I use and I have a special telephone number that goes to my cloud service. And if somebody faxes me something, I get an email that just has the fax attached to it. And if I want to send something, I just treat it like a printer. And so I don't actually have to deal with paper anymore. So there are more sophisticated ways to do things, but these are the vulnerabilities and cons of a traditional fax system. They have the same risks as printers, which is somebody will fax something outgoing and just leave it there because you know it takes so long, they're not going to stand there in the modern era. <laughs> they got to go run off to Facebook or Reddit or something to keep themselves occupied while 10, 20 seconds passes as the page goes through, right? So then they forget the page there and maybe it has some confidential information. Incoming faxes are especially bad. Somebody will fax you a confidential fax 
and they don't know when you're going to send it, so they're not standing by the fax machine for days. No, it'll just sit there at the fax machine. And then everybody who walks past the fax machine can see your confidential fax. Of course, just like any other telephone circuit, it's susceptible to a denial of service attack and caller ID is unreliable. Also, just like telephones, there's no authentication, authorization, access control, or encryption. Though there are some fax technologies that add a layer of encryption, there's nothing that's universally accepted. Just like any other telephone line, the cost for international calls can be expensive. And some fax machines can be hacked. They'll have some remote management capabilities and nobody bothers to ever reset the password. So they have the same standard password on every one of these things and you can dial in and hack into it, take control of it, reroute faxes to your own fax machine so that you can intercept the communications. You can use the fax machine to make outgoing calls and basically charge the person that you're attacking with the bill rather than you having to pay for it. So as much as I would love to see faxes go away and be replaced by uh, more modern scanning technologies, they're going to be around for a little while longer because so many people have business processes built up around the fax machine. Therefore, you need to understand it. And if your organization has fax machines, please go in, secure it, make sure they got the latest firmware on there, and make sure that you reset any default passwords. This is Tony Northrup for Train Signal and Thanks so much for watching this video lesson.